Good morning from South Carolina. A couple of years ago, I got a call from a guy named Chris, and like a lot of folks in the last few years, he'd recently purchased a track of land for his family to enjoy. Not commercial hunting or outfitting, just him and his family, you know, want to harvest a few deer and really partake in fixing up the property, watching it improve. Even if you're not a hunter, to see that is really cool. Chris hadn't purchased any property yet, so I said, hey, before you purchase property, why don't you send me some topo maps or something? Just let me know, make sure it's something that's gonna meet your goals and objectives. So we spent some months going back and forth on the phone, the internet, and he would find these places that were beautiful, but a little bit more in the South Carolina mountains are much hillier, and we all know the wind's gonna swirl, and a lot of them were primarily hardwood, high-graded hardwoods, and those are tougher to manage than pines, or we hear a lot about hardwoods, but you know, not many herbicide and fire's a little more difficult. There's, there's things you can do with pines to make that habitat much better quicker than you can with hardwoods. So through time, he found this property, sent me some maps. I said, Chris, that's a pretty good property. I flew down and met Chris, and I gotta tell you, it's just one of those times off the bat, we hit it off, had some similarities and values and family values and whatnot. We just hit it off. I mean, I could tell Chris was a guy that was gonna implement the plan and I was excited to put some boots on the ground and see what we had to work with. Chris has got a new property, we're all excited, and we're gonna lay out a habitat improvement and hunting plan. Now Chris inherited a couple of fields, which is great. We're gonna utilize them to feed deer and turkey. We're gonna be working in his timber also and make some hunting plots. Just come along with us today as we have a blank slate, as Chris says, and design a plan so he and his family can have some great hunting in the future. Chris and I got here, of course it was raw, very raw. There had been a recent timber harvest, so leftover clear cuts that are a year or two old, so saplings head tall and gnarliness. And the second part of the farm, I think if I remember right, might have been a different landowner, but anyway, there had been a guy doing some ag there. Now he was a tenant farmer, so he wasn't taking the best care of the land. There was nasty weed species in the fields and just, you could t erosion, erosion ditches. It had not been someone's just pristine farm. But I told Chris, fear not. I got a plan and we can recover this farm and you and your family will be tuned in to some quality hunting. Of course, my plan included food plots because with food plots, you can make a lot of ground quickly. Now, I'm a huge fan of working on native habitat, but even the best native habitat's gonna produce, you know, 700, 1,000 pounds of quality forage per acre per year. But the quality food plot, we can get tons of quality forage per acre per year. And throughout most of the South, and certainly the property Chris bought, which was some maturing or at least need thinning pines and cut over hardwoods and cut over pines, food was a limiting factor. So we laid out a pretty aggressive food plot plan, which included removing stumps or knocking over trees in some places and fixing erosion ditches, some actual grading to get started. Now I shared, I really liked Chris and thought he was a guy that was gonna implement the plan, but I mean, I went all out. This was a Cadillac plan, because he kept telling me, Grant, I really want to do what's right for the land. So, man, we addressed about 50 acres of food plots, more or less, and got him set up with a no-till drill, said, we're gonna recover this land, because folks, it was just gnarly red clay. When I say red, I'm talking rust iron red. Of course, red clay is red because of a high iron content. It'll stain your clothes. If you don't get a filter on your well, it will stain your fixtures in your house. That's the iron content in the clay. And this was just that old red slick clay. You know, when it's dry, you can't really chip it with a dozer. And when it's wet, it's so greasy, you can barely walk on it. That was the base for what we started with. Chris is a guy that's, him and his family are also health conscious. They want to do what's right. So we didn't just come in here with the strongest, baddest herbicides we could, or, you know, fertilizer truck on every quarter of the year, just dumping out fertilizer. That's a plan and it could work, but Chris wanted to take a different approach. So he was full bore the release process. Some of those ag fields had some gnarly, gnarly weeds in there, not easy to control. I shared with Chris, we could plant Roundup Ready beans and actually do a cocktail herbicides if we wanted to and get those under control, but Chris didn't want to do that and I honor that. 
So we started with a green cover blend, planted a little bit thicker than normal, just a, a blend with a lot of different species to try to choke out those weeds while providing some high quality forage for the critters. Chris had never used a no-till drill before, so that can be intimidating, but a few phone calls back and forth, and he was off and running. So Chris planted, started with about 50 acres from scratch. I mean, calibrating, learning not to turn tight corners with the drill, all those conversations. And, and Chris is, I gotta share, really matured in the past two years as a food plot farmer. With hard clay, it can be easy to plant seeds a little deep because if you got really hard clay and you got a little bitty seed, maybe like a buckwheat or a clover, it gets real deep and that clay gets dry, it forms a hard crust. And that seed only has so much energy in it until it gets leaves and starts photosynthesizing. So you got a little bitty seed and you got a hard crust almost like concrete, it's trying to push through there. Well, I think maybe Chris got a few seeds a little deep the first year, but we talked through that and the second year crop is looking a lot better. Chris has been on that standard release process rotation. We're planting a summer blend or a growing season blend here in this part of South Carolina. Pin on the weather, that's probably in May, maybe late April. He's drilling that the first year into bare dirt and now he's doing it what we call planting green. Let's this crop get, you know, waist tall or so and plants right through there. And in this hard clay, we're trying to plant about a half inch deep. That feeds deer throughout the summer, and then in the fall, Chris is drilling right through that with a fall blend. Has eight or nine different species in there, and that's what we see behind us. And you're, you know, deer have consumed a lot of the turnips and radishes and stuff like that, and Chris is seeing a lot of the cereal rye, a few of the oats made it through the winter, and clover. That clover, of course, is providing nitrogen for the summer crop, Cereal rye has a big root mass and it's doing a good job of fr fracturing that clay and adding organic matter. Now, and I've been guilty of this myself, but you see all the green on top, especially when it gets waist tall or so, you think, boy, that's a great source of organic matter. But actually, research has shown that about 70% of the increase in organic matter comes from all that root mass below the soil. So when I look at crops, I try to have that iceberg mentality. I don't focus just on what's on top, but I think about what's happening below the ground. That's why you often see me with a shovel or grabbing a big clump and pulling it out of ground so I can see what's below the ground. Daniel drove over while I was up in Minnesota this trip and you know, started looking at food plots and helping Chris and his family. He took some time out and took Chris and his son hunting. And wouldn't you know it, those rascals had a turkey on the ground before I ever got here. <laughs> there we go! Woo! A successful turkey hunt is fun in the field, but the fun doesn't stop there. They come back to the skin and sedge, of course they're processing the meat, and then they looked in the crop. You know how turkey is, it ingests food, stores it in this big balloon thing called the crop, and when they open that thing up, true testimony to Chris's work, it is just packed full of lush green clover. Packed full. Now there's a lot of lessons there, eh? Turkeys like clover, and if you do what we do and plant these blends, well those annual clovers come on really strong in the spring. Deer are loving that high protein, they're starting to grow antlers, carrying fawns, making milk a little later on. Turkeys are in there eating the clover and all the bugs associated with clover, not harmful bugs, good bugs, and those bugs are a really high source of protein for the turkeys in addition to the clover. That turkey was packed. Looks like Daniel tried to shove it in there, but it's just been eating clover. They harvested it out of a food plot where Chris had planted the fall release blend. It has a lot of these strong annual clovers, and that turkey was taking full advantage. I arrived late Saturday night and couldn't wait to get out there to listen for some turkeys, but for me, just as important to get my fingers in that dirt and see what's going on, what's improved over the last couple years. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, Moultrie Mobile, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, RTP Outdoors, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, National Land Realty, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. Look at all the ends bitten off there. That's the beauty of Blanson. You can tell Blanson pretty easy because it has 
a hollow stem. And so the whole stem has thinner cell walls and is more palatable. Look how normally deer just on clover, most clovers, deer just move the leaves off, but clearly they're eating lower on this because the stem is palatable. It's not got a bunch of lignin like a lot of clovers do. So it's just one of a mix, but when you pull it up, like if I just go here and pull this up and get it up here away from all the other green, look at all the ends bit off. I mean, so here, 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 and new stuff, new growth coming on. It's not flowering yet, so there's, you know, there's way more uh, produce coming off this, more forage to be had that's good quality. And we're not ready to plant yet at all. We need this to flower and make more biomass. But when you start looking, it's hard to see browse down here. But when you pull it up where you can skylight it, look at all the browse on there. But what really is telling, more than doing this, Chris wisely had a utilization cage and a yardstick because Chris is a master food plotter. So when I look at the tall stuff here, it's about 28, 29 inches tall. And outside, it's just above my boots. Looking over here, it's about 12, 13 inches tall. So they're removing roughly half of the tonnage that's produced. And when you pull it, think of a clover plant, and I pull this up, of course, the lower you get to the ground, less leaves. The top has more leaves. So look how many big leaves and thick that is. And look, let's do this. Let's compare the size of the leaves from in the utilization cage, because it's a bigger plant, hadn't been browsed on. Try and get them side by side to out here. And this is what deer want, right? This is the most nutritious part. So I talk a lot about how important a utilization cage is. It's a very simple tool, just a wire cylinder, stake down, so you can see how tall your crop is getting inside where deer are not browsing, same rain, same soil, obviously, versus outside. And in this plot anyway, there's still plenty of food out here, but deer are removing a bunch of it, a bunch of the volume, a bunch of the tonnage produced of high quality. This is, if you're wondering, this is, uh, of course, Green Cover's Fall Release Blend, and it has this particular clover species and other species and the small grains and turnips sort of thing you see behind me in here. Uh, but right now, this high quality, high protein plant is perfect for bucks getting ready to grow antlers and of course does getting ready to have fawns. Well, you can tell I'm excited because I love helping people reach their goals and objectives from a wildlife or a land or habitat management perspective. And Chris is just a great example of making rapid progress. He read the script, he read the playbook, and he didn't deviate. That's nothing about me, because I've learned from great people, great soil scientists, great farmers and practitioners that have been doing this for decades. It's, it's like it's just now mushrooming, so more and more of us can use this to improve our soils. And Chris has now become kind of a soil health evangelist himself. He's telling his buddies, and they're saying, ah, oh, that, that won't work in the Piedmont, that won't work where there's red clay. But he can bring him out here now with confidence and, you know, unless it's really dry or something, pull up a big old plant, maybe a sunflower, something like that's got a big root system in it in the summer, see some earthworms wiggling around and just really overtly, because we did this, we pulled up a crop, just a, you know, a hunk of cereal rye or clover, just a couple of feet off the road. So soil didn't change. Chris just started driving there. It wasn't like he hauled in dirt to build the road or put gravel down. He started driving there. I need a road here. And the difference in the color of soil from just a few feet away, laying it right there, may be the best indicator of all of the progress Chris is making. If you look here on the road, you can just tell, just hard, hard. What you don't know is there was an inch of rain here yesterday, an inch of rain. Of course, hit this hard uncovered surface and it ran off, caused a little erosion, a little road damage. But this is just hard, there's no, there's no pore structure, there's no earthworms, and that was all the way across this field when Chris cleared these spots out from timber and made fields. So we're gonna go six feet. We're just gonna go right here, okay? Now, you, you the red clay right there. Now I'm spooling up, get something I can get a hold of here. And look at that. I've got 
roots all over. I'm getting soil structure. It's turning black. It's, it's going to start at the top, right? Because that's where all the action is. It's going to start at the top. As the roots go deeper and deeper, we're going to convert more and more. So you can, if I turn this sideways, you can actually see a line from dark to not as red as in the road. You can tell, I'll get my shadow out of the way. It's darker than the road. And two years ago, it was exactly like the road. Exactly like the road. So planting good blend. And I want to mention, Chris has not added any lime or fertilizer in two years. This is just plants and the principles of soil health. God gives us the sun we need. The plants give us the carbon. Carbon's what's turning it black. And, you know, there's always talk about climate change or thing, but plants take carbon out of the air at a huge ratio and put it in the soil where it's supposed to be. I want you to think about all the cropland across America right now that's just, you know, it's just there's nothing growing. It's not converting carbon from the air to the soil. Remember, cereal rye grows about 32, 33 degrees, so those fields don't have to be bare. They can have a cover crop, saving farmers money, don't have to add as much lime or fertilizer. But this is telling, so, and I could have probably went closer. I'm about two feet. Oh, yeah. Two feet. And you can tell that's a little bit redder than this one was, but get my shadow out there. That's two feet. Two feet difference. Obviously, same rain, same soil, everything's the same. And that's the magic of plants. Uh, again, I think it's Ray Archuleta, great soil scientist who worked for the NRCS for a long time, said, without plants, we have dirt, which is what we have right here. And with plants, we have soil. I think this is a really good in illustration of Ray's point. Now, we don't have documentation of all this stuff, but the first time I was here and the first year Chris was planting and doing stuff, he says, and I know when I was here, we did not find a single earthworm. You've heard me talk about the proven grounds. I couldn't find enough worms to take my kids fishing. And now I often get 10 or 20 in the single pull up a seal rye or a shovel full. I've got enough soil built up now, I can actually get a shovel in the ground. We didn't find 10 or 20 at once at Chris's place, but over half the clumps of clover, old Milo stem or seal rye we pulled up had a worm or worms in it. So here's my buddy Chris in South Carolina. And Chris, this was red, you remember. Folks won't believe us now. We're only two years into your project. Y'all, if you've been South Carolina, Georgia, to Piedmont, North Carolina, Virginia, it's red clay. That red is from iron. It's red clay. Two years of, you know, summer and fall crops, cover crops, food plots, whatever you want to call them. You can see some residual red that you can tell it's turning black and an earthworm, a good size, healthy, active worm. We didn't, in solid red clay, you don't have that. I mean, none, right? You go to bait store and buy your fish and stuff. This is awesome. This is progress. Too. I get asked all the time, oh, that won't work in South Carolina. That won't work in Mississippi. That won't work in North Carolina. But we're turning it black. And you've had some droughts. You've had, you know, you've had issues on the way. Mother Nature's threw you a couple curveballs. You can see we're building up a little bit of mulch on the ground. Just a little bit. Um, right here. Oh, see the cereal rye? Coming up. Right. And it's breaking down. You can tell it's breaking down. So we're early on, this is gonna grow a lot more, right? But just at random, I just like to go at random, boom, here we go. And you can see the red in here for sure, but I talk a lot about chocolate cake and you're starting to see a structure to the soil. When you got red clay, it's just like you stick a shovel and just mirror slick, right? It's just slick. You're starting to see structure, just dense roots everywhere. Everywhere I go, it's just roots. There's just every little shave off, there's just root hairs, root hairs. And the roots are about 70% of organic matter that you add to the soil. So I've got Chris's soil test from Ward Labs. I haven't even sat down with him yet. But I'm gonna tell you, some of your fields are now bumping 3.8 which is huge in the South, huge. There's not a farmer in South Carolina who wouldn't go, 3.8 organic matter, man, I wish, you know, that's that's big. I don't even know what that means. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I, I'm gonna say on the standard red clay we started with, you were, you know, zero, negative four, I don't, you can't be negative on organic matter, but it was rough. So you got it, one field on here is 3.8 organic matter. And for every one you go up, it's like one to two, two to three, 
that will hold about another inch of water when it's dry. So instead of irrigating, you can just get that big rain and then it holds it through those droughts that you have coming on. Well, an inch of rain is about 22,000 gallons per acre. That's holding 22,000 gallons by adding that 1% more of organic matter going from one to two or two to three. Think about 22,000 gallons. How much would that cost to irrigate? It's not even practical in a food plot situation, but a farmer. And how much 22,000 gallons of water could get you through two weeks of a dry spell in the summer? Adding organic matter is huge to crop or food plot production. That's so rewarding to go from just sheety or platy soil with no holes in it, no structure, no structure to pulling up soil and seeing some structure, seeing all the roots in there and finding signs of life. That's going from dirt to soil. Dirt's kind of inert or dead and soil's alive, full of life. And Chris is in that transition. And another sign of that transition, remember this is South Carolina red clay. You go from Virginia, you know, down through the Piedmont, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, in the Texas, there's a band of red clay where the cotton farmers, they didn't know any better, just tilled, 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 wore out the land. It all eroded off and we're down to the B horizon, red clay. And I was taught in college that can, you know, we, it takes a thousand years to build an inch of soil. And that's probably true. If you're talking about a piece of limestone out here weathering, it takes a thousand years just to break down and become dirt. But add plants, add life to it, and it happens much quicker. And we're seeing that at Chris's place because that top quarter inch or so, it's black and it smells good. And then you go tra transition where it's kind of mottly and it's, it's dark and, and maybe some light reds and you get deep enough, you get down to red. Chris is building organic matter on top of the red clay. I share this literally, hear my heart, nothing to do with me. Chris is the guy that implemented it. He did it, he's a believer now, he's sharing with other people. And that excites me, because when I know something good, I want other people to know it. I'm not one of those guys that, oh man, I'm catching a white bass, don't tell anyone. I want everyone to have, you know, get their limit. Hopefully I get to the hole first, but get their limit, have some good food for everyone to eat, have their families eating food. Chris is sharing that, and you can do it too, on your land. I hear this all the time. Remember George in Texas? I won't work here, boy. You don't know here, it don't rain here. It won't work here. George got that sandy soil, deep sand. He'd been disking forever. He was a recreational disker. Or David Smith up in the mountains, he calls me Woods. Woods, I don't think that'll work here. Now, David and I have been buddies for 25 years, and only in the last couple of years, he started the release process. David's well on his way now. Chris, he's one of those guys that dies in the pool head first, and he's on his way to improving the habitat and making this land healthier. It's one thing to hear my observations and views, but I find it's much better to listen to the practitioner, the guy that's doing it. So I just want to take a moment and let Chris share his observations of this process. So a few years ago, we had the opportunity to go out and seriously look for buying land. We've never owned property. We've been hunting our whole life and it's been a lot of fun. We've always had the dream of owning our own property, growing our own deer. We just never had the opportunity. So when that opportunity came along, we, you know, everybody wants to be successful in whatever you do and whatever success means for you. We knew we wanted a, a really fine property. We wanted to be as as organic as we could, follow you know the creator scheme, and you know who better to call than the Growing Deer team once we could figure out what property to actually buy. So working with Grant, I, I sent him several properties that I was really excited about. But in conversations, we told him I, we're a family of bow hunters and how what our style is and what our dreams are for the property. Grant would not let me buy some of these properties that I was excited about. Finally found one that he gave me the thumbs up, quickly got mobilized, got the property under contract, bought it. And here, when he first came out here, right after we bought the property, Grant came out here to take a look at the place. I was proud of it because it was the first piece of dirt we had ever owned. And all I see are these big dreams and these big hopes of growing big deer and having turkeys just strutting all over the place. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was, it was kind of frustratingly fun at first because it was, such, it, it was such a raw piece of dirt. There was nothing that was alive out here. It wasn't close to the dreams that we had. So you had to have a little bit of vision to see what it could be. So Grant came out, put us a plan together. You know, we had to go get the, the Genesis drill. I had to figure out how to use it. It's not that hard. Um, and it's actually really nice. So 
grants back two years later to see the results of all the work that we've put into it. And I was a little bit, you know, disappointed with the way our food plots look. But then having Grant walk around and you stick your head over in some of these exclusion cages that he wanted me to put up, and I actually did a better job planting than I realized. So we're feeding a lot of critters out here. We actually have more deer than I thought. Um, we're gonna have to let the kids go and, and harvest more does this year. I, I thought we needed to grow a few more, but it's a lot of fun. I can't tell you how rewarding it is. And I just love being out here. It's a great way for me to get outside, enjoy creation, enjoy nature. The kids love coming out here. My wife loves hearing all the progress that we're making out here. She's not a hunter and she loves coming out here. So it's, it's been a real blessing for our whole family. And I can't wait for growing deer to come back in two more years, five more years, and to keep seeing the growth. It, I can't tell you how much fun it was when Grant pulled up, whatever it was he pulled up out of the ground and we're growing worms now. My wife and kids laugh at me because I watch all the growing deer videos and sometimes my wife will ask, what am I doing? And I'm watching videos on growing worms and she just laughs. We're thankful as we can be, grateful as we can be. It's a ton of fun. If you're on the fence about buying land, go get it and just get started. It never gets old to me, helping other people understand these natural processes. I always relate back to the Great Prairie and the bison and how rich that soil was and their process of trampling it down or wildfire removing the vegetation and it growing back. Something was growing year round. We look at the, the early explorers and what they wrote about the Great Prairie. Well, that's where we learn the principles of soil health. We're just replicating a natural system. Or as Ray Archuleta says, we're mimicking nature. We're just copying nature. And that's what Chris is doing at his proven grounds. He's replicating nature and learning these processes. And that's a great way to enjoy creation. Chris just loves being out here and doing these things. And that's important to learn. Man, it's something I want everyone to know. But even more important than that is taking time every day to be quiet and still and seek the Creator's will for your life and apply it daily. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.